Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on today's program, Dan Friedel has a story on how U.S. food makers are now permitted to add sesame to their products. Faith Perlow has this week's everyday grammar lesson on blend words. Later, we head to the Rocky Mountains as we continue our series on the national parks. But first. The United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, recently said that by law, food makers are permitted to add sesame to their products. They also must identify sesame content in their foods on product packaging. Sesame is the seed of the sesamum or benny plant. It is used to make oil and the seeds themselves are often used on bread or baked goods. The seeds come in black and white colors. Sesame is used in many foods to add a nutty flavor or some crunch. But the American nonprofit group, the Center for Science in the Public Interest, CSPI, says about 1.6 million people are allergic to the seeds. Someone who is allergic can get very sick after eating the seeds. People with the allergy usually learn to stay away from traditional foods that contain sesame. The CSPI is protesting to the FDA about a law that went into effect in January. The Food Allergy Safety Treatment, Education and Research Act known as FASTER, listed sesame as a major allergen requiring identification on packaging for the first time. Some food companies made changes to their production centers in reaction to the new law. Some cut sesame use completely. Others, however, decided to add sesame to products that did not usually contain it. As long as they identified the sesame on the food packaging, they were obeying the law fully. The CSPI and other organizations argue that adding sesame to foods that did not contain it in the past limits food choices for allergic people. Some food companies say it is too hard to prevent sesame from getting into some products, or it is too costly to change their production centers. It is easier to add sesame and identify it legally. Some restaurants are also adding sesame to their foods and noting it on menus or meal listings in order to meet the requirements of the food law. Robert Earle is a food safety advocate. He said the practice will put people with food allergies in danger of getting sick. It puts our community at greater risk, he said. Earle added that food companies and restaurants adding sesame to products reduces food choices. Earle said his organization, Food Allergy Research and Education, has received a number of complaints from people who said they got sick by eating formerly safe products. Ruchi Gupta is a children's doctor at Northwestern University. She is director of the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research there. Gupta called the FDA's decision disappointing and noted that the food company and restaurant changes are permitted by law. However, she said she hoped the FDA would have come out in a way to try to discourage 
putting sesame in unusual products. Robert Califf leads the Food and Drug Administration. In a message posted online in 2023, he wrote about companies adding sesame to their foods. He called it a practice with an outcome we do not support. He said, It does not break any rule, but that it limits options for consumers who are allergic to sesame. He also noted that consumers should check the label. Every time you buy a food product, even if you have eaten it before and didn't have an allergic reaction. The FDA also said companies cannot use language like may contain sesame if the product does not contain it. Peter Lurie heads the CSPI. He said he hoped the FDA's recent statements would send a message to food companies. He said... It's on the companies to act responsibly if the FDA is not going to force them to make changes. I'm Dan Friedel. What do the words tween, Barbenheimer, and brunch have in common? These words are portmanteaus, words that are formed by combining parts of two separate words. But unlike compound nouns, which are formed from two words, portmanteaus combine parts of the spelling of each word and their meanings. In this week's Everyday Grammar, we will learn more about how portmanteaus are created. We will also learn about their history and find out some common portmanteaus in English. Portmanteaus are blend words in English. They are formed from words or parts of words that are combined in some way. The spellings of the original words are combined into the new word, and their meanings are blended too. At the start of this lesson, you heard the word tween. This is a blend of teen and between. This portmanteau means the age in between childhood and the teenage years or around 10 to 12 years old. Barbenheimer is a blend word of the movies Barbie and Oppenheimer. It is used to describe the event of seeing both movies on the same day. Both films came out in movie theaters on the same day last month. And brunch is a common weekend meal that combines breakfast and lunch. Brunch is often eaten in the late morning and early afternoon and includes food and drink choices from both meals. Where does the idea of portmanteaus come from? We borrow the word portmanteau from French. Porte means to carry in French. And manteau, in French, is a coat. When both words are blended, a portmanteau means a large suitcase that folds in half and can carry a lot of things. So how did a suitcase come to mean all blend words in English? We have British writer Lewis Carroll to thank for linking the word portmanteau to blend words in English. Carol wrote Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. In his follow-up book, Through the Looking Glass, Carol wrote about the idea of portmanteaus. In the story, Alice reads a book 
with a poem called Jabberwocky. In the poem, Carol makes up several blend words. Alice is confused, so she asks another character, Humpty Dumpty, about the words. He answers, "You see, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up into one word." Just like the piece of luggage called a portmanteau has two sections folded into one, a portmanteau blend word carries both meanings of the original words, but folds them together to create a new word. Let's look at some common portmanteaus. Portmanteaus can be nouns, verbs, or adjectives. Some portmanteaus are created by combining the beginning section, syllable, or letters of the first word with the final part, syllable, or letters of the second word. They are often used in entertainment, for names of places, in government, for food, and for technology. Here are a few common portmanteaus. A biopic is a blend of biography and picture. It means a film about a person based on their life. Chillax is a blended verb of chill and relax, and means to calm down. Cosplay is a combination of costume and role play. Cosplay is when people dress up as characters. From video games, literature, films, or television, hangry means to be angry because you are hungry. Motel is a combination of motor and hotel. It is like a hotel, but for people driving on long road trips. Smog blends the words smoke and fog. To create the noun that describes air pollution, email is a blend of electronic and mail. It is the computer-based alternative to paper mail. Internet is also a portmanteau which combines interconnected and network. Podcast combines iPod with broadcast. Podcasts are digital audio programs. And lastly, we have vlog. It is a blend of video and log. These are journals that people record with a video camera and publish online. In today's report, we learned about portmanteaus. Portmanteaus have an interesting history in the English language. Writer Lewis Carroll created several portmanteaus. And described the term in his book *Through the Looking Glass*. Portmanteaus blend the spelling and meanings of two words together. Brunch, vlog, and hangry are all portmanteaus. Now it's your turn. Take the portmanteaus you learned today and try to use them in sentences. You can write your sentences in the comments. Or send us an email at learningenglish at voanews dot com, and that's everyday grammar. I'm Faith Perlow. Just heard Faith Perlo present this week's Everyday Grammar. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Dan. I'm happy to be back talking about portmanteaus. So you shared many portmanteau blend words in your story this week. Do you have a favorite blend word or two? Of course, I have a favorite blend word. I actually have two favorite blend words. The first one is glamping, which is a blend of glamorous and camping. It is camping, so staying outdoors, which is a really popular activity in the United States. 
but you have available some of the luxuries of home. For example, like a bed or a working toilet or even running water. I like this word because it's turned more people onto the outdoors and being close to nature. And I've done my fair share of regular camping, being from West Virginia, but I would like to try glamping one time. What's another favorite blend word? Spork. It's fun to say. And a very useful object. It is a utensil that combines a fork with a spoon. So you can eat your food with the fork part or scoop it with the spoon part. That would be a good utensil for camping, or in your case, glamping. Yes, it would. Do you have any favorite portmanteaus, Dan? There's actually several words I didn't even know were blend words, so it was interesting to learn that glob is a portmanteau. Glob is a mix of gob and blob. All are basically synonyms for a lump of a substance. For example, a glob of peanut butter. That's a good one. Thanks again for joining us, Faith. Our National Parks journey takes us to an extreme landscape in Colorado. Around us are clear lakes, aspen and fir trees, and mountain peaks that rise over 4,400 meters. Welcome to Rocky Mountain National Park. The vast Rocky Mountains range extends from the western United States up to Canada. National parks in both countries protect many of the huge peaks. Here in Colorado, Rocky Mountain National Park covers about 1,100 square kilometers. Although it is much smaller than other western parks, like Yellowstone, it welcomes almost as many visitors each year. People from around the world come to experience its alpine or high mountain environment. In the spring and summer, wildflowers burst to life and many kinds of butterflies arrive. In the fall, the aspen trees turn bright yellow and orange. In the winter, deep snow blankets the park. Its peaceful alpine lakes freeze over. One of the major sights here is the Continental Divide. The area in the high mountains separates the rivers that flow into the Pacific Ocean from the rivers that flow into the Atlantic Ocean. The Rockies' huge glaciers form the rivers. Glaciers help tell the natural history of the land. Over millions of years, Glaciers carved deep canyons out of rock. Erosion from wind and water formed the mountain's sharp summits that we see today. Rock at the top of these summits is some of the oldest found on Earth. It was not until 11,000 years ago that humans began living in the area. The Utes tribe settled here for part of the year thousands of years ago. Winter was too severe to survive. When the weather warmed, they lived in the green valleys and meadows and near the lakes. In 1803, the U.S. government gained control of the land we now call Rocky Mountain 
National Park. It came as part of the Louisiana Purchase, which almost doubled the size of the United States. In the 1840s, American writer Rufus Sage came to the Rockies. He wandered the area from 1841 until 1843, spending time with fur trappers, Native Americans, soldiers, and hunters. His long and detailed account of mountain life was published in 1846. He called it Scenes in the Rocky Mountains. Rufus Sage wrote, Further on were yet higher summits, surmounted by pines and cedars, raising their heads in stately grandeur far above the sweet valleys at their feet. Taken together, the scenery was not only romantic and picturesque, but bewitching in its beauty and repulsive in its deformity. Beginning in the late 1850s, gold and silver rushes brought huge crowds to the Colorado Rockies. Miners arrived in search of the precious metals. They settled temporary cities. One of the best known is called Lulu City. It was settled in the late 1870s after miners discovered silver nearby. By 1880, more than 500 miners lived in Lulu City. It had a meat shop, a post office, and many houses and mining companies. Lulu City was short lived. In just five years, miners left town seeking other opportunities. Today, some visitors choose to hike to this ghost town, where they will find old cabins and remains of buildings. As more and more people came to the area, concern for protecting the natural environment grew. In 1909, the nature guide and naturalist Enos Mills began pushing for the creation of a national park here. He first climbed the towering Long's Peak when he was just 15 years old. Long's Peak is the area's tallest mountain at 4,346 meters. Mills made the hike 40 times by himself during his lifetime and almost 300 times as a mountain guide. Mills wrote and gave talks about the Long's Peak area to urge Congress to make it a national park. On January 26, 1915, Mills got his wish. President Woodrow Wilson signed the Rocky Mountain National Park Act to make America's 10th national park. The Denver Post newspaper called Mills the father of Rocky Mountain National Park. Today, more than 3 million people visit Rocky Mountain National Park each year. Many visitors arrive by car. They drive the Trail Ridge Road, which winds through meadows and forests and up the mountains. The road was built in the 1930s, during the Great Depression. At the time, many of the western national parks were served by the railway. Travelers arrived on trains. 
but a railroad never served Rocky Mountain National Park. The National Park Service described it as always an auto park. The high number of visitors and vehicles caused concern. In the 1970s, park officials began managing crowds. They started using buses in the park and created a campsite system in the wild backcountry. Today, conservation efforts continue. Park officials educate visitors and urge them to respect the natural environment. Rocky Mountain National Park's scenery and wildlife attract huge numbers of visitors. The park has over 480 kilometers of hiking trails. They include challenging climbs up some of the tallest mountains and forest hikes that lead to the park's many waterfalls. They also include trails to crystal blue alpine lakes. One leads to Mills Lake, in honor of Enos Mills. The view of Long's Peak from the lakeside is one of the finest views in the whole park. One of the most extreme hikes in the park is the Continental Divide Loop. The 86-kilometer path cuts through glacial valleys and past lakes and waterfalls. It takes most hikers at least six days to complete. Long hikes give visitors a chance to experience Rocky Mountain wildlife. Within the park are hundreds of elk and bighorn sheep, as well as a small moose population. The park's huge number of large animals makes it one of the best places in America for wildlife watching. Butterflies fill the park's meadows. Some of the most common kinds are the painted lady, the arctic blue, and the western pine elfin. Butterflies help researchers in the park study the effects of climate change. Scientists and volunteers collected information on butterfly populations from 1995 until 2011. They identified more than 140 butterfly species. Park visitors also come to fish, bike, and go horseback riding. The animals are permitted on most of the park's hiking trails. You can ride in the park on horseback. You can explore on foot. You can sleep under the stars. You can sit by a clear, quiet lake. However you visit Rocky Mountain National Park, you will likely find, in the words of Enos Mills, the paths of peace and a repose that is sweeter than sleep. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Ashley Thompson. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.